Hello, and welcome to the third episode of Curiosity, Leadership and Analytics. I'm Simone Knight, and I'll be your host along this journey. I'll be joined by Donald Farmer, who each week will meet with two new guests to explore the future of data. Today we are exploring the new traits of leadership and how to get the most out of your teams in an increasingly digital work environment. Whether you're setting the vision or following it, data can make the difference for sustaining great talent and transforming culture. Our journey of curiosity begins now. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Curiosity, where our topic today is leadership and analytics. That's uh, an interesting combination of, of, of words there, both of which you could probably dig into for an hour each, but we're, we're going to try and uh, cover, I think, Two things about this are, are interesting, the interaction between these terms, the role of leadership in analytics and the role of analytics in leadership. And um, to have that conversation today, um, I'm joined by Joy and Randy. And um, I think we, well, we should just get some simple introductions. Uh, Joy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why this topic's interesting to you? Sure, so um, I have been in the technology industry for over 20 years. Um, I'm in a role of leadership, of leading engineers, but more importantly, leading a company um, through a smart home industry right now and connecting uh, great data with great insights and not only driving an amazing customer experience, but leading a team and a troop of engineers um, down a vision and, and towards common goals is really important to me. And I love everything about this topic. So thanks for having me. I feel honored to be here with you. That's going to be great. Thank you. And, and Randy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how the topic relates to you? Sure. Similar to Joy, I've been in technology for about 20 years, really focused on marketing technology and have been to several different companies. Uh, most recently, I was CEO of a big data company called Rocket Fuel, and then most recently was uh, CEO of another company called uh, Percolate, which was also focused on data and unstructured data. And so I've been really interested in how marketers have been using data in the digital space uh, in particular, to get better results and to drive better interactions. So very excited as well in terms of thinking about how do you bring data together as part of your overall marketing strategy. So this is kind of fascinating because you both clearly have had leadership roles, what we would what we would call leadership roles. You're both very senior people. And I'm interested in the concept of leadership. I mean, I think in this context, we can talk about analytics quite a lot. And I think we perhaps know a little about what analytics means, but I'm always personally somewhat confused by the idea of le leadership. I mean, we put people into leadership positions um, and we have this whole concept of leadership and people do degrees in it and they study and they teach it. But what is it? What do we mean by leadership? And what, well, what does it mean to you personally? Maybe the, the, the best um, kind of way of doing this. I mean, Randy, what, you, got, you got thoughts on that? CEO, what does leadership mean to you? Yeah, well, it's, it's a great question. And honestly, I've been studying it and failing at it for a really long time. I <laughs> went to the Naval Academy and actually went into the Naval Academy because I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to lead men in the battle uh, was the idea and uh, spent about eight years in the Navy. And so I had a lot of different experiences of of what it meant to be a leader and how to um, lead people and align around ideas and, and try to bring something into being it was interesting moving into the commercial sector. It was really, really similar in some ways in that I think a leader helps articulate the vision and, and frames what success looks like, which then leads to a conversation around data and what is the, the metrics that you're gonna be using to measure success. But I will say one thing about leadership was uh, in the military, we used to say you uh, lead, follow, or get out of the way, right? There were just two roles and just sort of, you're the one out in front and I'm happy to follow you. Uh, when I came over to the commercial sector, it was lead, follow, or let's talk about it. And so uh, a whole nother dynamic in terms of how to lead with people as you're trying to create a collective uh, perspective and move things forward. I think as, as I look back on my career, I spent most of the time getting out of the way. So um. yeah, right. <laughs> I was going to say, I still try to get out of the way. Uh, <laughs> Do you manage it? For the people that are smarter than I. Um, yeah, just to add to that, I can relate, uh, not in the military. I started my leadership career actually on a, a hockey field. So a lot of my upbringing was in sports. And um, I learned a lot about uh, the, the notion of teamwork, collaboration, grit, sweat, um, the need to have someone kind of leading the charge, but uh, the, the power and the unity um, that requires with the people behind. 
And I would say just from a leadership perspective, I, I think I'm still figuring it out too, uh, Randy, if that's where you're going and also with Donald. Um, I think setting a clear vision, setting goals that are tangible and that can allow people to truly relate and connect with them. And then creating a space where people can feel empowered to go and create and lead that way. Um, I don't believe in, uh, to me, leadership isn't singularity. I believe my team requires a lot of leadership and it's not just me. Um, if it was just me, it would be a horrible, it would be a horrible place. Um, I, I really believe in trying to create um, leadership in many, um, all the way down to the individual contributor. Um, every person must have some sense of um, the idea to um, lead towards the direction of where we're going. But of course, you're trying to set a common goal. I think that's fascinating. The idea of, of leadership in many. Yeah. Because when Randy started talking, I have to admit, when I, when I heard sort of, well, he joined the military in order to learn to be a leader. And I always think, and, I, and I'm sure I'm actually mistaken because I know a lot of military people and I, I know a little bit about how it works. Um, you always think of it as being very hierarchical. Um, and then your sports example of leadership in a field where people are, are, are also kind of participating as a, as a group, but they have to have individual decisions. That balance between being the, um, the personal leader, which I think we put a lot of store by in our society, you know, the personal leader, but this concept of distributed leadership going right down to the level of team seems to me really fascinating. Randy, in your journey, is, have you seen that shift from the personal leader to the kind of distributed um, leadership? Yeah, I think so. And and what is fascinating is I think in this specific moment, right, where ex we're experiencing distributed workforce and we're working from home and and how do you create a collective sense of identity and purpose and and continue to push forward? I think it's really been fascinating, especially for companies like technology companies where it, you can work from home. You're not manufacturing goods. And so how do you create the connective tissue across? Um, we have about a thousand people across 14 uh, different locations around the world and how do you continue to inspire and to Joy's point articulate a vision and help people feel like they're part of something that's bigger than themselves but they're also individually pushing forward their projects and every day able to um, uh, uh, contribute and 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 make an impact and so I do think this distributed leadership model is something that we're embracing and because of today it's becoming even more um, necessary to think about and how, what are the, the, the structures and the, the systems of alignment that you're going to put in place as a company and as a team. Right. You know, one, sorry, John, please. I was just going to say, I think also just we're both in technology, right? And the, the speed of change just actually fascinates me. We could have a whole nother podcast on just how quickly our jobs change on a minute by minute basis. And I think about how can I empower my team absolutely aligning to a common goal, but empower them to feel in charge of that particular capability, that particular uh, customer experience, um, I think will absolutely kind of catapult all of us in a quicker, more dynamic way. You know, the, the, the rate of change is dramatic. Um, and, and as Randy was saying, you know, the things now, we're, we're in this crisis right now. Um, and, right. and as we are speaking, we're, we're, we're in the middle of this crisis, which has forced us to be highly distributed. And we haven't planned for that. Nobody, maybe we should have done, but nobody had this on their on their calendar for 2020, or or or, or you know, nobody had this in their in their plans and their emergency planning. But we're now suddenly very distributed. That's a very different kind of rapid change from the rapid change to a certain extent that we plan for. So like technology change, for example. And and I'm just wondering from this immediate experience, how has this been very different? Um, because in a sense we're distributed without any choice. It's not as if we, we, we've we been able to either plan for it or or even we've had any time to um, compare different executions. We can't look at how other people have done this before unless we go back 100 years. Um, so how do we cope with this? And what, what is the role of leadership in this? Because leaders have been just thrown into this almost literally overnight, yeah? Randy, you wanna go or you'd like me to? <laughs> Joy, why don't you start and then I'll follow. So I was, you know, I can answer it in two ways, you know, from a, from a true kind of work professional pers perspective, being in technology, this didn't feel that different. And what I mean by that is, you know, my team re-released software 
three to four times a week, 5 a.m. releases, midnight releases. We do things on Saturday night. We do things on Sunday. Time zone, location, it's all digital to start with. Um, so that felt very natural. We were able to get in a very highly productive mode because that was already our way of operation. When I then shifted different parts of the organization, you know, I think about, you know, part of our, our role with my company is um, we save people's lives, literally. It's a piece of my business. Um, we have monitoring station. We have people that are in a call center that just can't pick up their equipment and go home and be on a 911 line. That was challenging. Um, and so it was immediately, how do we quickly leverage the technology, leverage the new process, leverage um, a new way of collaborating to get them in a home space that was safe? Um, and then if I kind of move all the way out to the community, right? The community, I think it's hit us really fast, right? And I call this as I was sitting for the podcast is my 10 year old still having a challenge with getting on Zoom and the teacher's having a hard time coordinating between who she can let in and who's in the meeting room, right? Or the waiting room. So I think it depends on where you are on that spectrum. Those of us that have been already in a very high, high dense, um, high complex technology world, we're used to it. It feels more natural. If you extend out to the community, it, it, it has actually um, pushed us. Um, push us hopefully in a really good way because I think that we're going to get a lot of great learnings and opportunities for us going down this this path. Now that's really interesting because I think there are some of us who feel um, comfortable is not quite the right word, but we sort of feel that this is an extension of our existing experience because we've been living lives where we're digitally connected anyway, yeah. and we may be working internationally. I, I used to do a lot of travel. I'm doing no travel now which ironically spend, means I spend more time with my international clients than I did before mm -hmm. because now I just connect with them. Um, and so I, in a sense, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for this. But I, you're right about the community. I mean, people aren't ready. I, I'm wondering, Randy, how you know, you've balanced that because your roles are very, very um, focused on community as well, yeah? Right, and I would just pick up on Joy's point with regards to, I think as a technology company and engineers who want to crank code and the people supporting customers being able to work remotely has actually been a, a benefit in some ways. Um, I would say that the leadership challenge is one of looking at chaos and looking at uncertainty and trying to reassure the people that it's going to be okay. When you have no certainty, when you're in a world that no one has ever experienced before, they don't know how long it's going to last. They don't know if they're going to get infected. And so I think in that case, as a leader, you start to um, bend towards or pivot towards the empathy where you're trying to lead with the heart rather than just the head. And so data often, when you're thinking about leadership structure and alignment, you're creating metrics that matter and you're creating release plans and you're creating all of the scorecards to run a business. But I think the thing, the, the magic to leader is if you can move from that operational leadership to sort of heart-based leadership of where you have to connect with people and connect with this very human need to feel safe, right? It's psychological safety. And so how do you create a container for people to move through the fear, the anxiety, the paralysis of the unknown? And I think that was, if you think about this whole experience is we've gone through probably as people, as companies and as communities phases in our understanding of what's happening, our interaction with what's happening and our expectation for what's possible. So now we're moved into another phase. And I think people are getting a little bit used to working together. Still, we have the uncertainty about the vaccine and what that means. And as we've all people who have kids, have had to go back into this next phase of kids going into school and like, really, it's going to be remote for the foreseeable future. What does that mean? I think us, we as leaders the collectively in the, in the commercial sector and the political sector and the religious sector, just need to help continue to um, create psych psychological safety. Randy, you've, you've kind of done my job for me here because this, this, is, this is wonderful because you actually brought the topic round to analytics as well. You were talking about the scorecards and the metrics that we set up in order to manage these things. But you also preempted what I wanted to say about analytics, which was you also moved into the area of empathy and, and, and having this kind of heart to heart connection with people. And um, the way you brought it up is fascinating because the two kind of flow into each other. Um, Let's, let's focus on the analytics a bit. I so want to get to the empathy. And sometimes I think as, um, I think sometimes data people 
there's a perception of us in the community that um, we're not particularly empathetic, that we're all about numbers and we don't get to the empathy. So I definitely want to talk about that. But let's start with the numbers. And you were talking about the the uh, the metrics that you set up and the dashboards that you need, uh, the scorecards that you need to run it. And, and let me ask you a very straightforward question about the current situation. How useful are your current metrics, your current dashboards, your current KPIs in the, in the in the current situation? Everything that you've worked on previously was based on how business was going for the last, say, five years, 10 years, whatever. It was based on a model of experience that now seems almost irrelevant overnight. Or am I, is that an exaggeration? No, I, I don't think it's irrelevant completely. I, I get your point. I, I think you, you, know, you have data like leading and lagging indicators. And so the lagging indicators is you're looking at your booking trends and you're, you, you have certain assumptions around number of sellers and number of deals they can do and the bookings that is uh, with their fully ramped, like what what that unit of work can produce. And I think you can still have a, a lagging indicator of the sales force's efficiency. And um, whereas with marketing, for example, if you're looking at metrics around marketing qualified leads and trying to figure out your funnel, that might be a little bit different in this new world because all of marketing has had to shift. Think about uh, in technology when we would do conferences and we would go, meet, you know, I spent 70, 80% of my time on the road to go meet customers and go speak at conferences and to have that whole field event um, component of your market marketing plan. Well, that got completely re-envisioned. I mean, this is an example of it today, right? This, this podcast we're doing is this probably would have been on stage six months ago. And so I, I, I do think there's this sense of trying to look at the historical trends, be confident that you, you're, you're, you're focusing on the metric that matters and then understanding the trend over time. And maybe it's increasing the beta in terms of expectation for forecast. So if you had your sales go to market engine really locked in and you knew this quarter based on this many salespeople over the last 12 quarters you've been able to hit you know x amount of dollars is well there's a little bit more cushion there and i think every executive that i've talked to for example in uh, silicon valley has just reduced bookings forecast by 40 percent for this year and it's just the cushion it's kind of the standard across all vcs all the portfolio companies have reduced it by 40 percent. so we've created an artificial um, uh, constraint looking at the unknown, but I think it's just you're in this situation and you just you've increased the potential variability of the outcome. But the core metric that you're measuring bookings or renewals or MQLs or throughput and velocity on your on your engineering, I think are going to remain the same. It's just how confident you feel about the ability to forecast. That's super interesting. I mean, Joy, Joy do you have an, an opinion on that? Because uh, yeah, I would I would echo that. I I think that you know during this particular time, the core metrics or the core fundamentals of our business have absolutely not changed. If we were to pan back, though, you know we're now shifting a little bit and magnifying in different leading indicators. Um, it would in our business, we did not have a very large uh, digital presence across the entire customer lifecycle. It just wasn't necessarily something that had typically uh, driven um, where we were as a business. How we're getting to those core metrics have changed dramatically. Digital and every, I mean, our digital transformation has accelerated a thousand times. Um, we've done more in the last three months than we probably have done in the next five years. I'm really grateful for that, for the role that I'm in, because that makes my job 10 times more fun. Um, but I, I think that the core metrics of our company have not changed, just to echo what, what Randy was saying. Um, how we're getting there and some of those leading indicators, we are looking at things slightly differently just because of the uh, nature of what's going on with the economy right now. Right. That's fascinating. That I mean, when, and it says a lot about your core metrics that they don't have to change. It shows that to my mind, that suggests that you actually have a very good model of your business already established. Um, I wonder if that's true for all people. You know, that I, I suspect that some of the people I've been talking to have been kind of struggling because they have done this digital transformation and they feel their core metrics have actually had to shift somewhat because they haven't been ready for it. So I'm really fascinated by the fact that and I think it said, says a lot about your technology leadership that that um, in both your cases, the core metrics are actually well established and speak to your existing business and the business in the new world. Um, 
I'm wondering, have you have you introduced any new metrics? Is there anything, you know, in, in terms of analytics and trying to understand things, um, how the business is and where it's going, is there anything that you've uh, changed? Yeah, for us on the digital transformation side, absolutely. So again, we had had to, like little, like dipped our toe into some of these key areas. How do we do a better job at um, putting more into the hands of our customers all the way from, you know, self-scheduling, self-purchasing, um, video level consultation rather than in-person consultation. So although we had some of those um, basic capabilities, we've just really accelerated them. And so those are some of what I would now call as more of our, um, where we've shifted our magnifying glass. They were there, they just weren't as prominent prior. And now they're really important. <laughs> so it's a, it's a new focus um, on what is leading and driving this next wave of, of business for us. What drives our bookings looks a little different now than it did um, four months ago. For sure, yes. Randy, does that reflect your experience? It does. I'd, I'd like to just picking up on that and shifting a little bit to the company I work for now, Seismic, um, is focused on content and the efficacy of content. So producing content and marketing and then distributing it through sales and having prospects or customers interact with it. And this idea of the data associated with content is a, re is a relatively new concept. When you think about marketing and sort of the art of marketing versus the the impact of marketing. The art of marketing is the creatives coming up with the concept, creating these beautiful um, uh, executions, and then distributing from TV, print, radio, and then into the digital world. So to Joy's point, I do think you're seeing a lot more people embracing digital as a channel. The thing that's been really interesting is the association of the data with the content. And so this is more unstructured data, and how do you think about what data is working? So let me just give you one one data point. Uh, I was talking to a large tech company last year, asked them how much they spent on producing content a year. They said $40 million. I asked them, how much of that content do you know is actually making an impact? And they said they had no idea. I said, best guess, 50%. I said, okay, you have a $20 million problem. Is that, a, does anyone care? And they said, well, the way we've been producing content for so many years, it's just, you kind of add 3% a year in terms of the budget and you just keep cranking the content out because you've not been able to connect the dots between the production of the content and the impact of the content in the sales cycle. So again, kind of to Joy's point, the digital transformation of companies, the digital transformation of content has led to this new area of exploration of what's data, what data is meaningful with content? How do you associate different tagging? And then how do you provide, how do you process all that data in a way that leads to insights to inform new ways of doing marketing? And so we've been doing it. And it's been something I've been focused on for 20 years is this right message to the right person at the right time. But I think the technology has finally caught up to allow companies across the spectrum to be able to be very thoughtful about an area that they may have thought was mostly art, but now they're able to apply science to this. And so you get these marketers, uh, the art uh, marketers and the science marketers and the heads of marketing now have to be uh, embrace both. They got to be multilingual. Excellent. And, and so what we're seeing here actually is the emergence of a new type of analytics then. Yeah, exactly. And that is fascinating to me because, um, you know, this is a dramatic crisis. This is a very unique crisis, but it's not the first one we've been through. And in my career, what I've seen is through every crisis previously, which were typically economic or political crises of some, of, of some sort, new technologies, especially new analytic technologies have emerged. And they always emerge almost specifically for the reason you've described, that we now have new things to analyze. Um, I think back to the oil crisis in the 90s, which was actually when data warehouses really started to come out because suddenly people needed not just their standard reporting, but we need to have an overview of the business because things have changed so much. And we had the dot-com crisis at the end of the 90s and the 2000s. And then it was, oh my goodness, we need, um, you know, we need a, even more insight. We need more operational insight, and we can't get that ourselves. So then you saw business intelligence emerging, and uh, that was a super interesting area. And then we had another kind of crash in, in 2008, and then we saw self-service business intelligence emerging. I can't wait for IT. This is such a crisis, and the world is moving so quickly. I can't wait for IT. I need to do it myself. And those set of um, analytic technologies emerged at that point. And so I think we're probably in this crisis, and, and, and I think it's your suggestion, on the verge of another analytic wave of new technologies and new analytic 
requirements, which are based around what you suggested, you know, kind of unstructured um, data and the ability to analyze that type of content. Um, I mean, am I right here? Does this feel natural? Yeah, I, and I think uh, a great point. Let me just make it really crisp. You take most large B2B companies have distributed sales forces. Those individuals up until six months ago, the way they did sales was they jumped on a plane, they flew to their client, they did their pitch face to face, right? And did some follow-up afterwards. I can, and I spent many trips on the airplanes doing that, helping out with the sales cycle. I cannot imagine a client in New York to say, today saying, Randy, I'd love for you to go to the airport in San Francisco, get on an airplane, fly to New York, go sit on the subway, and then come meet with me in my office to give me a pitch. And I think that's true for every single field sales rep. Every single field sales rep is now inside sales. And now all of a sudden, all of the experiences they had with regards to uh, nonverbal communication, being able to you know, make the act magic happen in the room is obsolete. They have to completely re-envision the way that they're gonna engage with prospects and customers because we still gotta sell stuff. And so I think to your point, what does that look like in terms of empowering salespeople with information, uh, knowing what to do, knowing what to show, knowing what to say? And how do you, how do you completely rethink the way that you measure salespeople's effectiveness in their engagement? And, that, and, and now you can measure their interaction because of the content being shared back and forth between the customers and the prospects measuring the way the prospects are engaging with those pieces of content. How do they follow up with coming to your website? And so I do think to your point, Donald, like what we have assumed as sales is, and, and marketing and support of sales is going to be completely different going forward. And how do you know what's working? I think it's, it's, a, it's a brave new world there and we're all going to try to figure it out together. <laughs> well, it's a brave new, and, a brave new world and a rather scary one, yeah? But yeah. Uh, so Joy, maybe... One of the points that Randy made earlier was about empathy and this difference between empathy and, and well, not the difference, but the relationship actually between um, knowing the numbers and the empathy that you have as a leader. I'm wondering, um, I mean, we think of salespeople in this situation and they can no longer use all those sales skills and interpersonal skills that they've developed. They have to develop a new set. As a leader, how do we lead people through that? I, I would tend, you know, I think one of the most important things on leadership is connecting with people period. So it's more, I don't know of another way to do it. You have to actually lead with that first. And so um, if you weren't leading with a level of empathy and connectivity with your customer or your team, you probably weren't leading very well. And so when I think about that, um, and I, it's interesting because I'm actually in, in the scenario that Randy was going down, I'm, I'm, I'm the customer in that way, right? So I wear the CIO hat, I have the digital officer here. Um, people are selling to me all day long. How they interact with me, how I need to now be educated, how I need to now be um, experiencing um, the technology, the service, the outputs, is, it is going to be very different. Right. I can right. no longer just rely on that team coming in um, with a demo on my screen. They're going to have to connect with me in a very, very different way. So I can echo that. Um, I guess just on the empathy side, I just, you know, empathy is one way of saying it. I, I like to just think about it as connecting with people. Um, everyone is at a different um, phase of their life. They're all going through different personal things. Some people, I mean, especially right now. Um, it is such an unbelievable time. I, I always look back at this particular three weeks of any year. It's always going into Q4, which is a strategic planning cycle for any corporate company. And it always is a back to school season. And, and I happen to have two daughters going through teenage years. And so this year, this time of the year is always um, a very challenging time in normal circumstances. It's, it's now exploded and I think about the working parent right now, I think about um, the working female right now. Um, something has to give. And um, I do worry, and I, I think about what can we be doing as a community, as a country, to ensure that we don't look back at this time in 10 years and see this massive fleet of females in the workplace. Um, we've worked so hard to drive 
um, diverse perspectives back into the workforce, especially in STEM. Like we've been working so hard at providing um, different skill sets for different types of people. And I do worry that we are going to every company, every leader, every manager, you have to be connecting with your people in a different way. Um, and we need to be adjusting how we run our work, how we run the workplace um, to ensure we are continuing to sustain and maintain great talent. Um, great talent is gonna come in many different ways. And I just wanna ensure we're keeping great talent in the workplace during this very time, trying time. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up in particular, because um, in my experience and um, in, as a hiring manager and as a manager of teams, I've generally found it um, that my organizations, the companies I've worked with have been very committed to, to hiring women and, and um, have actually done, to be honest, a reasonably good job of hiring women into technology companies. Retaining them is a different matter. And enabling you know women to continue, and, and this is one of the the things that really annoys me. We very often look at the hiring numbers, or we look at the mix of numbers in an organization, but we very rarely look at the retention. And what I often find is people hire women into into strong positions, and then they, you know two three years later, uh, those women are moving on because they're not satisfied in that role, but either because they're not moving up, but very often just because the company isn't making the adjustments that they need to make. It's one thing to say, I, I was talking to somebody the other day about this, about a conference. No, we want to, we want to, um, we want more women speakers at our conference. Can you, can you give us some names? The, the, the right answer to that is no, I'm not going to give you names. Please make your conference more, <laughs> more attractive to women to come, to come and attend. That's the way you do it. Um, and I'm really worried about this particular phase that we're going through because I think the burden of, of COVID is falling almost entirely on the shoulders of women who are having to, to, to juggle work and family. And the fact that work is distributed is in some ways even worse because now the work is in the home. Right, right. I mean, I would just, um, I, I, think the, I think the burden is falling on two working parents. Um, I think the challenge that we deal with is the data shows that women are still not necessarily at, at, at um, par um, with men in terms of pay equity. So when, when families are um, dealt with a really challenging situation, something has to give in the household, it tends to be based on a financial decision, right? So um, I do think it is, a, it, it is just exemplifying, it's already been a challenge, at least in our community, in our country, and I know it's been a challenge in other communities as well outside of the United States, but it's an opportunity at its best right now how do we you know, shine the light on a, um, a way to ensure we're bringing and maintaining um, the, best, the best talent? Um, that's what it basically comes down to. And I think there's a lot of great data that goes to show um, diversity. And it's not just gender, right? It's diversity in all different ways, thoughts, experiences, educations, ethnicities. It does lead to better business results. And very simply, especially in my business, um, you know, we are a smart home company. So my, my customers are diverse. <laughs> if we can't connect with who we are selling to, we're not doing a very good job. You have to reflect uh, the community. Yeah, that you're you got to reflect with. the community, the people that are designing products, that are supporting the products, that are selling the products. Um, we want them to be able to connect and reflect with the community that we're selling into. So a lot of that has to be the natural, and you were saying, you know, connection rather than empathy. So you have to have that connection. But then you're also suggesting there's data that helps you manage that connection and to kind of flip into our analytics mode. What are what is the data? Not necessarily the, the individual data points, but what is the role of data in helping you to lead with an analysis of something which is actually very human and. Uh, I, I don't want to say fuzzy in that sense, but you know, it's 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 about human needs and it's about human experiences. And what is the role of analytics in that? Do you use analytics in a structured way to do this, or is it a question of you know I I, I know what I need to understand, so I'll go and look for the data to to, to either support or challenge me in that? No, I think it's a great question. Um, I would I think about it in two ways. How do you think about leading in terms of um, actually your employee base uh, internally within your company? How are you thinking about using data and analytics within like the customer's experience? That one's actually a little bit easier, right? I mean, there's a lot of great ways that obviously we're using data and insights to drive a better and fuel a better customer experience. That's what Randy's business is all about. I'm actually really interested in better understanding, Randy, what you do. Um, 
from a from a leading people perspective, it's a very fine line um, in terms of leveraging science and data with marrying up with that empathy and connection um, to motivate and lead people. Um, but without a doubt, there's all there's always an input that should be quantifiable. Um, that's then married up with other um, insights that you have to lead people in a better way. Very cool. So, Randy, yeah. we're, we're all interested to know more about what you do. <laughs> I think um, <laughs> what is the uh, in, in your world, which is which is definitely very analytics driven. Mm. How do you find that balance of, of how do you use analytics to to reinforce the the empathy and connection, which is clearly a very important part of your role and your experience. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think in some ways um, it's 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 a, a problem that you use data to help dimensionalize, but then you have to use the empathy to to flesh it out. And what I mean by that is, look, everybody has their employee SAT scores or their employee NPS, and you do your surveys, which I think is really important to do, and that you're able to have consistent and regular surveying of your employee base. Um, you, In my last company, we had uh, twice a year reflection on the leadership cadre, because if you're going to build great leaders, you want to get a feedback on how they're doing. And then we sort of had the social contract surveys. So people were getting surveys once every uh, once every quarter, um, different levels of response required. But we were able to uh, slice and dice the information by region, by um, um, underrepresented minorities, by function. And so you had a lot of data to sort of work through to see how people were perceiving the social contract, their fit within the job, their, um, uh, their relationship with the management and what they thought about leadership. And as long as people were being honest, you could use that as a trending data over time to sort of see, hey, are we doing better or worse? Um, what I would say is the real value out of that was a couple things. One was um, it, it helped reinforce a culture of accountability that we would say, hey, here's the data, here's the set of things we're going to work on, and you made that part of your agenda. So it wasn't just about delivering bookings, it was about delivering on the social contract. We heard your feedback, here's the three things we're doing this quarter, let us know in the next survey, did we make traction? So accountability and transparency, uh, which I think is essential to building that social connected tissue as you go up and down the, the chain. The real power, though, comes from the conversations you have with roundtables after the survey. And so if you take the data to the people and you say, hey, help me understand, like my team, we, you know, we scored well here. What, what do you like or what do you want more of? And it looks like across the team without calling people out, this is where we were struggling. Can you help me understand what, what's the perspective or what are some of the things we could do to make that better? So I think the empathy part is in the conversations you're having with people using the data to help inform because the data is never going to be 100% right. And I think in those conversations, when you're creating space for that type of conversation, the data is also an excuse for the conversation rather than just walking into a team meeting and saying, hey, guys, how do you feel? You know, thumbs up, thumbs down is you have this anonymous data that then you can start a conversation. And I think people I know when I was more junior in my career, I just liked people listening to me talk. Clearly, that's why I'm on the podcast. But I think this opportunity to engage in a conversation over time. And then I think the final piece is you create a collective alignment and 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 consciousness and agreement that you're going to work on this together. It's not a leader problem. You know, I always talk about it, winning is a we thing. Like we as a team are going to have to figure this out. So I don't have the answers, right? You have great ideas. Let's come up with something that we agree to as a team that we're going to work on. And we can't do all of it, but we're going to pick three things. And I think that's where people feel they've been heard that they can express themselves anonymously, they can express themselves in a group, that there's clarity around what the leadership is doing with it. And there's this real sense to Joy's point that it's a team, right? It's not a collection of individuals, it's a team like a hockey team or a football team or whatever team that is engaged together in the success, not just of the business, but of that team. To add to that, that the, the psychological safety, Randy, you brought that up earlier on. When you bring in that listening tour, you bring in that real life forum to augment the data inputs you have, it really starts to create that foundation for psychological safety. We found that it actually unfolds a whole bunch more than what the data said in the NPS surveys or customer sat, employee sat. And creating that ongoing 
dialogue, bi-directional, um, and a place where then you can follow up and follow through, um, it does then start to seed hopefully a more transformation in your culture. And I know that's also something we kind of talked about earlier. And I'm kind of taking from this that the conversation is absolutely critical. I remember Alan Weber said way back in the 90s, Alan Weber was the founder of Fast Company magazine. He said way back in the 1990s that in, in the new economy, in the information economy, uh, conversations are the most important form of work. And I think he's, he's not talking about hanging around a water cooler. He's talking about those kind of conversations. But they have to be informed by the data, yeah? I mean, you can have the listening tour, but the data actually provides a sort of um, a basis for it. It's not just an input to it. I mean, I like the idea of the psychological safety. I think that's that's absolutely fascinating way of putting it, that it provides the um, the foundation on which you can build those conversations. Yeah. yeah, and it provides a baseline to how you measure it, right? Ultimately, you have to come back and improve. Um, and so I think that's absolutely critical. You can't do one without the other. Uh, you have to actually do both, is I think what we're suggesting here. So there is a little problem at the back of this. And and, and um, before we kind of wrap up, I'd like to just kind of, in some ways, it's a little off topic from leadership and al analytics, but we're getting so close to it. I can't resist going over the edge here, which is about privacy. Because we're talking here about feedback on your leadership. We're talking about people in your teams expressing their ideas about the, the team. And I know when I was a, a, a leader um, working at a, at a fairly large company, you know, and I would get the, the leadership survey back. And if it wasn't careful, it would say, you know, 90% of your people think you're a great manager, Donald. You know, 10% think you're absolutely terrible. Trouble is, I only had a team of 10 people and um, I knew who that one person was <laughs> and I probably shouldn't have been getting data at that level of, of, of granularity. And in fact, you know, a, a good practice would have would have masked the data, provided a level of key anonymity, and I, I probably wouldn't have seen the results only for 10 people. Um, but I'm kind of fascinated by this question of privacy, because on the one hand, you want to open these conversations up. And on the other hand, you have to respect people's privacy. And I just wonder if you have any comments on that, any thoughts on it? Yeah, so I think that all of those surveys are anonymized at some level, right? It's either four to six survey respondents. I think that part of the um, training of the leadership cadre needs to be how do you handle the data and do you go out on a witch hunt or do you take it as inputs to inform a conversation? And so I, I do think there's a delicacy with which you need to have these conversations and and um, I imagine that there are some employees who perhaps don't trust the system, don't trust that it's anonymous. And so they answer it in a way that, oh yeah, my manager's great, even though I think they're horrible. I guess the, the point is, is that the, the, the surveys and the round tables are part of a broader strategy in terms of your employee engagement. And so, you know, I was just thinking, um, you know, what's the other data points I use to get a, a, a pulse on the community? Uh, one is I, I've shifted my, uh, one-on-ones to be, and usually I always think about, I build relationships through the work. Like, what are you working on? What are, you know, what are we driving to? And, you know, what's my, our agenda? And I think that in this time, I've shifted a little bit to open the conversation with, well, how are you doing? And my point is, is that over the, if, you, if you're maintaining the one-on-one -on -one connections, which are critical and maybe easy to um, uh, not prioritize, but in a distributed workforce, you have to prioritize and you're working with your individuals and you're leading with empathy in the one-on-ones around, hey, how are you doing? How's things going with your family? I know you have kids, like uh, how's the work-life balance? You start, that's another set of data that you're bringing in as a manager. It's not tied to the survey feedback, but it rounds out the, um, the employee experience. The other mechanism clearly is if you have a strong HR people ops group, who they too are seen as a source of anonymous feedback that are able to, I know when I was CEO, having my uh, my head of HR, uh, she it was, happened to be a woman, people trusted her that she was their confidant and that she could help me smooth out my rough edges. And so I think that there's these different ways to collect information that helps you reassure people that um, um, they're, you, you're, they're really being heard and it's being done in an anonymous way and that they're able to see the changes are being made. At the end of the day, employment at will, right? Like if they, if they don't think they can trust leadership and they don't trust the systems, then they can probably go find another company or job. But I, I do think if leaders lead with this idea of family first, 
we're here, you know, truth is on the front lines, we want to hear from you. And they're genuine in the way that they set up this multi pronged strategy for employee engagement, that that enables people on the privacy level to feel trust. And, and you know, that goes back to psychological safety and Maslow's hierarchies of need, If they don't feel trust with the organization and with their manager, like, that has to be repaired and addressed uh, immediately. But um, maybe I lean on the the side of I'm a little bit more um, optimistic in terms of people aren't going to take advantage of the data to exploit folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you bring me back very strongly to a point. Of, a, a friend of mine, Scott Davis, once said something which, which the more I hear it, the more profound I think it is. He said that uh, people don't trust data. They only trust other people. And, um, you know, that level of trust is important. You know, as as we kind of get to the end of this, I want I want to sort of not so much get a call to action for people because I think that's always a little artificial. But is there anything that you've learned, particularly through this, these last kind of few months, that you'd like to share? That that you feel people um, that that you've seen in your experience and Joy, you know, you've spoken very in really interesting ways about um, the way in which this has happened so dramatically and so quickly. But your core business. Uh, metrics, if you like, stayed the same. I'm wondering, you know, given that, do you have some sort of advice or, or, or some sort of view of, of, of how things should be different going forward or how people can, can, can rearrange their work even once this crisis is over? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, what this crisis, I think, has um, unveiled in many ways is that we can go a lot faster. We can do un unbelievable like almost Herculean level of effort types of change when everyone is surrounded by a common goal and led towards a common goal. Um, so the we talked a little bit about just kind of this really ruthless level of prioritization, but I think what this, what this time has brought us is like really fundamentally is like checking back on your core business strategy. And do you have everyone maniacally focus on what that thing is. And if you do need to shift, you can shift. Actually, we just proved it. Everyone in the whole world mm. was able to prove you can shift at an like incredible pace and an incredible speed at massive scale um, yes. within milliseconds. Um, so I felt, you know, like moving forward, it's just almost like, how can we use this as an opportunity to just really check back in on your core business strategy? Do you have everyone truly aligned? And are, have we done ruthless prioritization so that we can all accelerate at a faster pace? Because I think that's the other big thing is time to market speed. Um, it's going to continue to be uh, critical. And it will be interesting to see, you know, we're so productive. We have been very productive, but at some point there'll be a, a tipping point where you, we are, humans like to be social. We collaborate in person. Like I like to feel the energy of people together on a whiteboard. Um, at some point we are going to need that again, I believe. I don't think it'll only be possible with just the screen. Um, I think we're gonna to have to be able to figure out how do we start augmenting that. But again, checking back in on your report strategy, being ruthless with prioritization, leveraging the data to ensure that you're still focusing on what those core fundamentals of all your business, how you're getting there, I guarantee has shifted. And if you continue to focus on some of those nuances and the new aspects of that um, with data, with insights, um, it will get you there faster. That's wonderful, yeah. Yeah, so 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 Randy, I mean, you know, how you get there, the prioritization, the, the the speed, the agility with which you're working seem to be super important. Do you have advice? Do you have something that you've taken away from the the last few months that you can share? I yes, just sort of building on Joy's point. Fundamentally, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a data guy. I love uh, metrics that matter matters. The OKR system that John Doerr built on top of the uh, the Intel Andy Grove at Intel, and I just think every company, every division, every team should have a scorecard, and they should be focused on the uh, the metrics that ma matter. The difference being now, as I think, any any idea that you're going to know what's happening in a year is is false and that everyone should focus on 90 day plans. So to Joy's point, 
Like, what is the ruthless prioritization, spending the time to understand the capacity you have to deliver on whatever your, your metrics are within 90 days? And how do you really get deliberate about that 90 day planning cycle? Whereas before, I think there was a lot of emphasis at companies around year long strategy planning. And I think now going back to that point of you have a wide variability in terms of what the outcomes are going to be, but you can really, I think, control things as leaders within 90 days and managers within within a month uh, and just having people really focus on um, outcomes, right? And the impact that it's uh, delivering versus the activity. I know for me personally, I like going to the office because I like seeing people, but also if you're the guy and you're in early morning, you just get to see who comes in and you get to see when they leave. And you know, this trust now of, hey, if we defined what success looks like and people have their lives where they may have to take kids to school and they're gonna work later at night and they're gonna balance it that's very different than coming in the office from eight until six. And so I do think that's another uh, thing that I've been working on personally is how do you be ruthless in my own uh, prioritization and communication to the team of what is the most important things that people need to accomplish and then giving them the freedom to manage their days to accomplish it. I'm thrilled at the resonance between you. Um, between the two of you and, and and your opinions, because this um, this this point about prioritization, but also this point about empathy, I, it's um, it, it's it's been fascinating and connection. I really hope we do get back to the human connection. It's going to be incredibly important for us. And um, as, as human beings, you know, we we may be empowered individuals, but we are not just social. We are we're deeply connected with each other. Um, I've just found, even remotely, I found this conversation fascinating. I hope one day we can have conversation in person. Um, but I'd like to thank you so much for this. This has been absolutely fascinating. I think tremendously useful to people. And I wish you both all the best, both in your business and in getting through this crisis personally. I have tremendous confidence that in both ways you will. Thank you very much. Despite widespread use of BI tools, leaders still experience a lack of visibility. However, we can move faster and go bigger when we work around a common goal. It's important that as leaders we adapt. With our workforce juggling more than ever, we can no longer ignore psychological safety. Creating spaces where people feel empowered to contribute their best has its own ROI through retaining and growing top talent. On behalf of Donald and I, we invite you to follow us as we continue our journey of curiosity. Don't forget to subscribe to the series. You won't want to miss episode four, where we'll be discussing the link between curiosity and confidence. So join us next week, and remember, stay curious. <laughs>